Um, now, I could talk to you, Tyler, about any, any of your topics of your 13 books from you know, everything from Indian classical music to street food in America, but this is the Margaret Thatcher conference. So I figured we'd start by asking, I guess, well, we're about to have a budget in this country in a few, years time, a few days' time. Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt are going to reveal the alternative to trustonomics. Um, but we seem to be living in what you described in your 2011 book, The Great Stagnation. Now, we are looking at um, the GDP growth in Britain is going to be either flat or just under flat for years to come, as far as the eye can see. Now, you became optimistic about growth, about during the pandemic you were talking about, well, we are getting innovation now where these mRNA vaccines, things are beginning to move. But you've just landed in a country where the economy is standing still and looks seem set to stand still for quite some time. What are we doing wrong? I like to say that I'm very optimistic about South England, and I choose those words carefully. If you ask how many places are there in the world where you can actually develop a new idea and execute it. South England, the triangle with Cambridge, Oxford, is one of them. The vaccines, right? Deep mind comes from here. But I think the problem is your biggest successes come in ideas production, and those are public goods. So the nation, the United Kingdom, doesn't actually benefit that much from them. And with South England, you've created something that's actually already advanced upon the next Singapore. You've exceeded that. But the national benefits to that are smaller than one might think. And the question is, well, what do you do with the rest of the nation? And that's my like, very simple take on why it is you're stuck. OK. And you've traveled pretty widely around the UK. I think you're saying you've been pretty much everywhere in these islands apart from Aberdeen. Um, uh, Northumbria, I've never nor been to. Northumbria yes. as well. Um, but what, are we doing a, a worse job than other countries at trying to spread the concentrated wealth of the, of the Southeast. I mean, the phrase leveling up has been one of the Conservatives' missions for the last for several years now. The implication being there's something which marks us out, uh, being unable to spread that wealth. Is this something that every advanced democracy has to, to, to the extent which we do? Or do, does Britain stand out as a country which really does hoard the wealth down south? There's something about the education system here, the status markers. Look at this hall, right? There's William Pitt up there. This is from the whatever century it was, a guild hall. The status markers here are not conducive to egalitarian outcomes. I don't know how you change that all. If you drive around the Netherlands, it's very hard to find any town that just truly looks like a dump. If you drive around Great Britain, put aside Northern Ireland, but you find plenty of places that are so far below the average. But I think it's ultimately cultural. And from a distance, I enjoy the culture you all have here. But the markers of status, they're neither like truly dynamic slash tech, nor are they egalitarian. And you end up with this mix of all the different Englands or Britons that you have right now. Well, Liz Truss's attempts to get out of this, she described it as growth, growth, growth. That was her mantra. And she came out with a, a plan to do this. It will be deficit financed tax cuts and to get the economy moving. An agenda which was denounced by almost everybody. There are about a handful of people who were willing to say that this was, it had some good ideas here. And you were one of them. Do you regret that now? The Yimby talk was great. I always doubted if she meant it given Tory constituencies and what a lovely nation Great Britain is. It's very hard to mess with a lovely nation. Fortunately, my nation is either incredibly beautiful or ugly, right? None of it's lovely. That's one problem. The other problem is the huge spending on the energy bills, which I never favored. That was by far the biggest part of the package. And that should have been geared only toward lower income groups. The tax cuts I thought were fine. Uh, I don't agree with the Laffer curve, but look, the UK is probably headed into quite a long recession. And the idea that you should be raising taxes and cutting spending as you're heading into a recession is far from obviously the right thing to do. My sense is markets would have been unhappy anyway. And the way in which the market reaction has been fetishized, when I think, well, we're in a world where only a few months ago, you know, FTX had a market valuation of $32 billion. 
And I think we need to do very careful forensic analysis. What was it actually the markets didn't like? There's the pension assets liabilities mismatch, behavior of the Bank of England in some ways undermining the government. Truss was not very articulate. Maybe she said she was going to do even more. That spooked people. You put that all together, what the markets actually didn't like, uh, we should not be so dogmatic about that. You talk about the fetishization of the markets here. Now, this is something where we have gone through our politics anyway has gone through big swings on this. When David Cameron came to power in 2010, he said, we need to balance the books, we need to do austerity, and if we don't do this, the markets are going to come and punish us. Look what happened to Italy, the guilt years are going to spike. So the main thing a conservative chancellor needs to do is to balance the books. Now, a lot of people expected interest rates to go back up, but they didn't. Then it turns out the markets were willing to finance all kinds of government misbehavior. So we had a decade where you could pretty much borrow as much as you like and you got no market reaction at all. Uh, you've got now quasi Quartang and this trust, they were in lockdown. They were looking at the markets thinking, this is just amazing. If the markets are willing to lend Britain the money to shut down the economy, then surely they would lend us the money to transform the economy. So what, did they miscalculate or did the market's mood suddenly change? Right now, the UK has a debt to GDP ratio of about 80%, which is high but not enormous. If you translate that into a debt to national wealth ratio, it's much lower yet. There is this question that right now we don't know what real interest rates are. If you just measure them directly, they're quite negative in much of the West. But what will future inflation rates be? How will interest rates respond to that? So when you're in a world where you don't know what real interest rates are telling you, you don't know what they're telling you. It's not obvious to me that raising taxes and cutting spending is what this nation should do headed into a probable recession. I think the best method moving forward is actually just to pick the right policies, whatever you think those are, and just not obsess too much over macroeconomics and real interest rates, which is something, frankly, whatever people tell you, no one really understands it all that well. Just like obsess, what are the best policies now? Do those. Right, because this matters quite a lot. Like, what did the market, market say during the Liz Trust, um, I always call it era, but it was like a, a few <laughs> days, right? Four or five weeks, interregnum, whatever. Um, did the market say, no, your trickle-down economics doesn't work, here you are trying to borrow for tax cuts, we will not put up with that. Did we see a message from the markets that they wouldn't tolerate that? Or has this message been um, projected onto the markets by political opponents of Liz Truss, most of whom are in the Conservative Party? You know, mentally, I've lost track of the numbers a bit, but, but I recall that before she backtracked, like the pound was only down 1%. And in terms of the interest rate effect, knock-on effects on mortgages, it, we're in a very volatile time. Market prices change a lot. There's plenty about what she announced that I thought was wrong. Most of all, so much spending on relieving the burden of energy price bills for people. So I just don't see that there was a market referendum, a definite vote against the tax cuts. That said, I don't think in the short run those tax cuts would have boosted growth. But if you simply adopted it as a national principle, we believe that for tax reasons, living in London should not be worse than living in New York City. That seems to me an entirely reasonable principle for this country to have. And that was some of the thinking behind what they did. And we should not throw that away. So how then should a country like Britain get growth? We've got the highest tax rates for 77 years. They're probably about to get higher with the budget we're expecting on Thursday. Um, we've got a, um, a massive government machine that it's difficult to cut politically without a caustic reaction. We know Rishi Sunak, for example, is dead against a lot of Boris Johnson's high spending things, but now he's prime minister. I very much doubt he's going to cut back on the ways he identifies because he'll be thinking, well, if I do that, they're going to come at me too hard and, and therefore I'm stuck. So is, is Britain now in a sort of a low growth, high debt, high tax trap? It seems to me the United Kingdom needs to stop thinking of nostalgia as something that comes free and price it like you would price carbon emissions with a carbon tax. So there's a lot to be said for British nostalgia. As an outsider, I greatly enjoy it. I love driving around your countryside, the green belt. I don't pay the price for that. But your mix of what are your status markers in your culture 
and how much you treat the nostalgia as a free lunch. So by nostalgia, you're, you're referring to what? The way the countryside looks, where we can't build homes, why we can't have fracking, what about wind power here, wind power there, uh, the whole way the past is thought about as a glorious thing. That the, the ongoing project of the nation seems to be, in some sense, to cling to even a former notion of the nostalgia, not maybe even the current notion. But you're referring, I mean, some people would say this is simply, it's not nostalgia, it's environmentalism. People value the countryside, they value their communities. This is nothing retrospective about this, that the, the fracking guys would rather, uh, the fracking opponents, <coughs> would simply rather their, um, the life of their town was left unaffected than if people come up and start drilling from it. Is it necessarily nostalgic? to be, um, you must get this in America as well, to be against um, big property or energy developments. Fracking on net has a green effect in a world where there's still a lot of coal used. I think the actual barrier is a kind of nostalgia, and I don't feel it's my role as an outsider to tell you exactly how much nostalgia you should consume. I just want to see it be explicitly priced. So if you all decide, well, we're gonna do the slow growth thing, and like those melodic XTC songs about, you know, British this and British that and the Lake District, like, that's your decision. It's not my decision. I'm, I'm personally better off if you, you know, double, triple down on nostalgia. I don't need to see fracking in this country. Like, I can go see it in Pennsylvania. It's a, you know, a few hours drive away. But it does seem to me it's treated as there's some way things must be and there's this trap and then at the cultural side, the status markers, you look around us, like that's William Pitt. This is an incredible hall. There are Victorian add-ons to this much older building. But the updating of the narrative, you, you don't see in this place, right? It's sort of stopped at some point. So the only narrative one hears is somewhat disgraced. That's like, well, part of England as the new Singapore. I think you've already achieved it for part of the country. It's just like how much more of the country can you bring into that? But what is respected here, like before we heard from a woman, a baroness, again, that, that's all your decision. But st status markers could be different and more conducive to innovation, and one has to decide. Okay. So you'd be in favor of more, more planning and more development, and that's certainly a big debate within the Conservative Party right now. I, I don't want to say I'm in favor of it. I would just like to see it be priced explicitly the cost of the nostalgia. Again, as an outsider, I don't vote here, I don't live here, I'm not a citizen. Uh, I'm not sure I have a right to a final normative opinion, but I do see that nimbyism in this country is a massive, arguably the biggest obstacle to progress. Economic progress, GDP Economic progress. Economic progress, GDP progress, living standards, and compounded growth rates over time result in enormous differences. You look at a country like Italy, which for almost 25 years it has, has had no per capita GDP growth, has plenty of the past in an amazing way. Like, you can be the next Italy. Some would say you are the next Italy. That's a choice, right? Italy's still a great country, but it's a choice. All right. But let's talk about another aspect of Britain, which is quite um, striking right now, that we have just had a Rishi Sunak as prime minister. Uh, and here, he sort of demonstrates a trend which is quite striking. You know, when I go to America, quite often I see Americans at the top of American companies. In this city of ours, this nostalgic city, you see no such thing. It's like um, Wimbledon, we provide the um, venue and the world comes and plays and, and they win. Now we've got here a, um, an, um, an Indian prime minister, um, Indian origin anyway, uh, and a cabinet which were three of the four great offices of states are held by non-whites. Do you think there's something about the British system? By the way, this is quite uncontroversial sure. in Britain, right? And I'm wondering, the debate is very different to the states. And the other, quite often we are seen quite often by Americans as being um, backward looking and quite fuddy-duddy. But I think that here we've got to, um, when King Charles gets crowned, which is going to do next May, you're going to get a scene where a Hindu prime minister with a shrine in number 10 will be walking there with his Indian wife where you're going to get the home secretary who's a Buddhist will be organizing security. You're going to get the, the chief rabbi is spending that night before the coronation as a guest, of the, um, a guest of the king. To me, this seems a country which is pretty at ease with the modern world. And I wonder if such a scene would be possible in the United States. 
I don't know if it would be. We do have two potential presidential candidates who are Indian origin, Nikki Haley and Harris. Uh, I think it's fantastic that he's prime minister. Just great, great news. It will help break down previous status hierarchies. But the general notion, how high status is it here in the nation as a whole to make a lot of money and work really hard? It seems to me there are strongly conflicting opinions. This in some ways does give you a better society, a better country, a more cultured population. It's a choice you can make. Uh, the obsession with money making in America does in some ways make us uglier. But it gives us higher GDP growth. And we are opening up a lead on Europe, not just the United Kingdom. And America has done remarkably well, keeping its culture of being aspirational. Comes maybe originally from 17th century England. The Puritans have a personal project. You see it through, become almost a bit of a maniac, obsess over hard work, you know, give to your community in a certain way. Anyone can be one of God's elect. Uh, you know, no titles of nobility, rejecting a lot of older style distinctions. Uh, having Rishi Sunak as prime minister is a great step toward moving closer to that world, I think. But in some ways, isn't Britain now more of a successful melting pot than the United States? We are 20% of a workforce are immigrants. That's higher than there is in the US. And again, I talk about who tends to be at the top of American companies. I mean... Oh, we, sure. Yeah. You may be a better melting pot, but the non-melting pot part of the country is not going as well mm. as in the US, I think. Right. But nonetheless, if Britain were to be the 51st state of America, I think it would be the poorest state in the union and GDP per head. It would be poorer than Alabama, Mississippi. Um, We'd love to have you nonetheless. You know, Adam Smith favored this in Wealth of Nations, and I think he understood which would end up as you know, the tail and the dog. We don't expect you, but again, I I'd vote yes on that one. Right, but, but our two countries have quite a lot in common. But you think the main thing holding us back isn't so much, because I think the way that we are embracing certainly globalization, immigration trends, I think the, the, the success which, which we have um, digested demographic change over the last 20 or 30 years, to me is a standout of quite a modern country. But you come here and you, uh, what, what strikes you is a nostalgic country and one whose nostalgia is holding it back. I think of there as being a portfolio effect. So the more Britain in some ways changes, other parts of the portfolio have to be strengthened, the nostalgia part. So I'm actually optimistic that in the medium term, there'll be a lot more building of homes here. Just like a simple question. Since the year, I don't know, 1100, like when has it been a bad time to bet against more homes will be built in any part of the West? Like basically never. So it's a question of when, not if. Um, so again, I'm very optimistic about things here. It just doesn't always feel good. And how much success you've had with the triangle in southern England, it seems to me you all underrate just how few parts of the world there are that can pull off what you do here now on a regular basis. Again, I would stress this point. The benefits accrue to the rest of the world more than here. Or look at your best, most popular cultural creations, James Bond, right? The Beatles. It doesn't help England that much or Britain. It's mostly people out there who benefit, the whole world. So you've taken on this role of benefactor of the world in a funny way. Like maybe originally, well, one thought it was the empire. And now you've done it for real. And like the empire, it's not as good for you as you might have thought. But you're doing it. And I don't want to talk you all out of this. Like you're one of the places I look to for great new stuff. And I get it super cheap. So like it's working. There are metrics other than GDP per capita. Like how much do you do for me is an important metric and others. And you're cleaning up. I mean, <laughs> congratulations. Well, you, you, look, it's funny you say there are metrics other than GDP per capita, but you are, are quite a persuasive advocate about why that metric is probably the single most important one, a proxy for a whole bunch of other things. And that's the one metric which isn't going anywhere for us. But it's what you do for world GDP per capita. I pay money to listen to Beatles satellite radio station that goes to an American company. Uh, British product, right, from Liverpool, there you go, world GDP, but not so much for GDP here. Now, there's a tourism sector in Liverpool, all the cabbies take you around to Paul McCartney's home, that's great. Like, that's something, but most of the benefits are external, benefits of deep mind. Incredible company. Most of the benefits there will be external. So part of the problem here is you've probably unintentionally specialized in this funny kind of altruism, again. 
Now, your latest book is about um, finding talent um, and the various ways in which... Kind of, now, I wonder if one of Britain's economic problems is a failure to harness talent. Certainly when it comes to, as we've, we, we've discussed, the way that I think um, that non-whites prosper here is pretty good. It's pretty difficult to look at Britain and think this is a country which does worse than other countries at harnessing the talents of those who come here. I think the group most likely, least likely to get university in Britain are the white working class boys. That's a demographic which we've got problems with. We've also have a problem in trying to integrate the rest of the economy uh, a chunk of the workforce into the economy. In Glasgow, in Liverpool, in Birmingham, something like 20% of these cities are on out-of-work benefits. Now, that is a pretty big chunk of any city, of any workforce. Um, yet, we've somehow managed to do this at the same time as having 1.2 million vacancies. That's a, pretty much a record high, and about twice as many as we had on average of the last decade. So what do you think is going wrong where well, we seem to have combined a, a crisis in shortage of workers with historic levels of people on out-of-work benefits? Yeah, the Scots-Irish parts of the United States have very similar problems. I don't pretend to understand culturally at a deep level what is going on, but that's what I suspect is going on, that there are some areas, some histories, some practices of ethnic groups that are just not as conducive to success. They can change a great deal over time, but in, in most short runs, they're fairly sticky. So I, I don't think I have an answer as to what you should do. Uh, again, there's plenty of parts of the continent where you can go and you don't see the same problem. There might be high unemployment in some of those countries as a whole for periods of time, but it's not so concentrated in particular places in this particular way. So uh, I wish I knew the answer to that one. All right. So would you, I mean, and one thing we, you haven't really mentioned is basically tax cuts as development of, as a way of trying to get growth. Um, is that because you reckon that, no, no, there's a, th a theory here that I'd like your opinion on. Um, the theory is this, that we're basically, we've outgrown as a country, as a democracy, the era of low taxation that we've got demographic pressures, the older population, they're needing health care, and then similarly you've got also an area, an era of deglobalization, if you like, that all of these things that were working well pre-pandemic are now going into the reverse. We now need to be building up our military. We now need to be um, preparing more for conflicts in Ukraine, Taiwan, who knows where. And that these various forces mean that the future is one of big government that the Thatcher agenda was of its time, and that there is no point trying to look in the late 70s for any insights as to how to turn around a stagnating economy, simply because the past is another country. And right now, for as long as you've got, uh, we have nationalized health service absorbing 45% of government spending, which it soon will, and the vast majority of the health service is going on, on, on the needs of, of those who are of pension age, there is nothing we can do about this. Demography is destiny, and our demography points to a high-tax destiny from which it's futile for conservatives or liberals or libertarians to try to escape. There's a lot in that question. First, I think of your present as already a high-tax regime. Uh, every time I've been to this country in my life, I felt it was a high-tax regime. I've sometimes thought, gee, I'd love to move here. But then I think, hmm, it's a high-tax regime. So I can see a bunch of reasons, some of which you mentioned, why taxes might be going up. Just having to fix your NHS and make good on underinvestments in capital that for a long time made the service look cheaper than it really was. I worry a great deal is another thing that might cause taxes to go up. But I don't think you surrender. I think you say, well, there's some level at which the taxes being that high doesn't work anymore. Margaret Thatcher saw that. So the other stuff you want to keep as low as you possibly can, right? So it's a portfolio effect. The more bad news on taxes you see, aging, NHS, the more you think, well, in other areas, we'd better make sure we're not going to have taxes be so high. Because there is a threshold effect with taxes. You know, you cut your top rate from 40 to 35%. I'd say it barely matters. England once had a top marginal rate, what, of 100, was it 95%? Sweden, 102%, if I have those numbers right. That's insane. You can't do it. They had to change. Margaret Thatcher did that. 
So the insight of Thatcher is there's a threshold. You will reach that threshold. You have to do everything you can to avoid reaching that threshold. So her lessons still are relevant. Don't surrender. Don't listen to Martin Wolf. I read that column today. Did you read Martin? He's like, all these reasons, taxes have to go up. And then he like embraces it with a bear hug. It's like, no. It's like you could list everything that's wrong with your car, why it has to break down. Some of it might be true, but you know, you'd better take some care to fix at least some parts of your car. Right. So right now, we, we were in a country where the top rate of tax is 48%. Uh, Liz Truss was going to re reduce that to, to 41. One of the many things she um, had to give up on. And therefore, it's going to probably stay that high for the foreseeable future. Um, so, but was the lesson of that not that politically, forget about the economics of it, because that tax cut, I think, even the Treasury worked out it would cost 2 billion max, probably would be a negative cost um, if it stimulated, persuaded more people like you to move here and start paying taxes. But we'll never know because it's not going to happen. But wasn't the lesson there that politically, this thing isn't possible, that you cannot come in with this low tax shock therapy and expect to survive more than a couple of months in office? There's plenty about your politics I don't understand. More generally, I don't think it's the task of an economist to come in and surrender and say the best policy, whatever that may be, is politically impossible. What is politically possible changes radically over time. I didn't ever think communism would fall. I didn't think Thatcher would succeed. I didn't think Reagan would necessarily succeed. And maybe in some ways they didn't quite. But again, just focus on what you, you think is the best and say that's what we should do. The, the very naive approach here, I think, is underrated. Is that why Liz, one of the areas Liz Trust went wrong, that she wasn't a very good advocate for the supply side reforms she was implementing? When I watched her on YouTube, I found it extremely unconvincing and underwhelming. Now, again, I'm an outsider, but you know, I'm not against it all to begin with, the way some voters might be. So if I'm not convinced, right, something is wrong in the recipe. Right. And I watched Rishi Sunak do questions period you know, before parliament. Yeah. And I think on fiscal policy, I, I'm worried they'll, they'll tighten too much. But you saw how impressive he was defending this, that, and the other, whether or not you agree with him. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, is a sea change. And don't obsess too much over you know, what might happen now. It seems to me uh, there's a very smart and capable leader sort of carrying a lot of the right symbols. He'll have a bit more time, and we'll see. But you think we might tighten too much? That might be the, the error we make. From what I read in the Financial Times about the Hunt plans, which are still not clear at all, and the timing to me is not clear, maybe in documents somewhere. But it seems to me a weird mix of tightening and not tightening, and some of it comes after the election, and some of it's not credible, and it's all confusing. And the markets, are they going to be impressed by that? I don't know. Uh, but I wasn't persuaded by that either, to say the least. So I would be somewhat worried there's too much tightening. But I readily admit I haven't understood it very well. But that may be part of the problem. Okay. Who do you admire right now? Then look, looking around the world, who do you think has got um, COP? Because right now, when Thatcher was there, she had Reagan to look at to draw inspiration from. Of course, there were parallels. She was working on her agenda before Reagan came to office. But there was still a little bit of inspiration. Is there anybody who you could point to now and think, look, here is a, a brave leader who's doing some reforms which are working? I would say I have a great hope for the elite in this country, England in particular, that the number of people here truly interested in boosting the rate of economic growth is higher than anywhere else I know of, except perhaps for Singapore. And Singapore, I think, has other problems that you don't. So why are we losing the argument, then? That growth isn't going up anytime soon. You know, it's too soon to say. It's like Shao La, you know, when they ask, what do you think of the French Revolution? Well, it's too early to say. And he said that in the 1970s. So strong countries tend to do well when you ask, in this country, is there still enough belief in liberty and in markets and in individualism in the rule of law? It seems to me you're very much all still in the running. And you see those in think tanks, in your recent leaders, in your current leader, uh, in terms of what you have done. You've made London what, to me, is the world's greatest city, uh, Cambridge and Oxford. Quite, you know, very much better than they were 30 years ago in a highly significant way. 
cities of the north seem to me to have made somewhat of a comeback. And I just don't see the big reason to be that pessimistic. Like, don't just look at Twitter or the newspaper. Think of long-term historical trends. The entire Anglosphere, I'm extremely bullish on. And English as a language, because of the internet, is much more important than it was. So the fact that you all speak passable English didn't matter that much 40 years ago, but it does a great deal now. And right. um, how optimistic are you about the success of democracy in general? And there, are, I mean, we, we're recently we're, we're speaking as a, as a war is being carried out for its defence right now, and there's a, we're at a, a corner where it's not quite sure if we're if we're slipping back to a system where the strong will do what they will and the weak suffer what they must. I'm not optimistic about Ukraine as a nation moving forward. I'm extremely optimistic about democracy in countries that were democracies, say, in 1970. You're one of them, a great deal of Europe. I think American democracy and its strengths is underrated. Our very recent election, American voters went for the center, rejected Trumpism, re rejected election denialism, picked something that's pretty sane and sensible, whether or not you like every candidate who won. And I think we're going to do just fine moving forward. So. I'm bullish on democracy in places that have democratic traditions. Now, do I think you know, the Balkans 50 years from now will be well-functioning democracies? Like, mostly I don't know, but I'm not like intrinsically bullish on it. OK, so you don't sort of see history having a democratic bias then? You don't see countries like um, Ukraine becoming more like the EU, say the war is over? I believe in path dependence. When I look at the path of Ukraine, I see that since Catherine the Great, it has been part of some kind of Russian or Soviet empire for almost the whole time. It's not what I would predict for the immediate future, but it seems to me they will never be credibly independent. I would think they'll be independent, but Aling, a more extreme example of some of the post-Yugoslavian states after that war ended, where a lot of talent leaves, no one really wants to invest there, reconstruction doesn't go that well and it will drag on and bleed on and be ugly and become very corrupt. And then at some point you have to wonder, do they take the money they have and try to buy a few nuclear weapons to prevent the next invasion? Is that an optimistic scenario? No. But again, I think once democracy takes hold, the desire to keep it is remarkably strong, and it's a very large part of our world, a very large part of our GDP, and that should make us pretty optimistic. And what do you think about the do you think there won't be a rise in failed states right now? There already is. I mean, look at Haiti in, in my hemisphere. It's not just failed. It's literal Hobbesian anarchy. It's not even ruled by mafia-like gangs. That would be a huge improvement. It is in just violence in the streets every day and, and no government worth a damn whatsoever. And no one who wants to intervene, no, no way out that anyone can see. Right. So is that um, almost a bigger risk than the rise of authoritarian then, the collapse of the rise of anarchy? Well, I think we're seeing both in some places, and maybe they're ultimately the same trend, that uh, there's something about pessimism that is contagious. There's something about weird ideas that is contagious. We came off this period where China was remarkably admired, and the US had some, some bad events and some bad years. And you can have like small external beginnings and trends then snowball. And in some parts of the world, we're seeing this. So the bad countries are getting worse, China, Russia, Clearly much worse. Latin Pretty positive on India with caveats. Latin America? Uh, country by country, but I would say significant parts of it are getting worse. Peru being like the biggest step downwards. Brazil, you hope with the election they've turned a corner, but I doubt if they have. Mexico, one quarter of it is ruled by drug gangs. Uruguay doing remarkably well. Chile just dodged a bullet. Argentina has turned out to be wonderful for breeding startups, but their fiscal house is still not in order because their interest groups are too dysfunctional. Very varied stories. I would say somewhat more negative than positive at the moment, but far from a complete disaster across the board. Right. I once um, heard you asked what were the three countries you'd most, because you're, you're an incredibly well-traveled economics professor, what, what were the three countries you'd most advise people to travel to? And you replied, Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. What year was that? No, I, but I mean it. You have so many civilizations there. There's Aztec, Mayan, so many indigenous groups, medieval Spain, the Baroque, the Enlightenment, 19th century positivism, early 20th century modernism, North America, Mexico itself, 
and they're all layered in a way a bit similar to how India is layered. Some of the world's best food, uh, super affordable. For visitors, it's mostly really not dangerous. Wonderful scenery. What's not to like? Okay. Um, and on the subject of enlightenment, how do you think that project's going on right now? Do you think we're, we're seeing it? Have we hit a zenith? Are we seeing its decline? Well, I'm debating John Gray on Thursday night, and I think that will be the focus. He's so pessimistic. I mean, I'm a voluntarist in this. It's up to us. So it's up to the free countries. Most of all, it's up to the Anglosphere. The birthplace of liberty is right here in England, in Britain. The Enlightenment, the Scottish Enlightenment, everything else. So I don't think it's, it's baked in. Uh, I'm optimistic it's my temperament, is a kind of can-do mentality, like let's wake up and do something. So the, the headlines never look fun, right? But uh, I would much rather have the problems of today than say the world's problems of 1960. Okay. What do you think that um, lockdown told us about people's general instincts towards liberalism or lack thereof? I mean, in the first few weeks, nobody knew anything about this virus. It was came out of the blue. For all we know, telling people to, to stay at home and sending the police after them if they didn't might have been the best policy. Uh, but lockdown had massive public support, I think, in this country. Something like 60 or 70 percent backed the government policy whereby you could get um, apprehended by the police if you met somebody for a coffee, as two women walking in the woods um, did to what were many similar cases. Um, I'm wondering if this showed a kind of liberal bent, not just in politics, but in the public overall, and whether we might have actually passed the zenith of liberalism and be heading, heading now towards, by popular consent, illiberalism. I think some lockdown was necessary, but it's striking to me how much people have turned against it, even maybe in some cases where they shouldn't have. So what's turned out to be popular in the United States is the Florida and Texas models. And that kind of lockdown, for better or worse, could not happen again. And all the people who said, like, oh, these infringements on our liberties, they'll be with us forever, they're not with us forever. How many of you here are wearing masks? I can't even see a single mask. Is there any law saying you all have to wear masks? COVID's still out there. Uh, the vaccinations you have had are like maybe 20% effective against the new strains, which I believe are at least 50% of the COVID circulating in this country. And here we are, blah, blah, blah. I'm like talking to you all, don't worry. I've tested recently and I had COVID four months ago. I really don't think I'm COVID positive. But we have decided we prefer liberty. And as an election winner in my country, it's very clear where the weight of public opinion is. And that is we're not gonna do this again lightly. Uh, I think my own state, Virginia, actually did it pretty well. We had two months of lockdown, and then we started undoing lockdown. I think we should have undone it a bit quicker than we did, but I think some lockdown was necessary, but you truly and absolutely have to treat it as temporary, and we did, and we have resumed our liberties. So but to me, I'm super optimistic exactly for that reason. Right, so you, you basically think, then, the, um, that the public opinion jury is out and the verdict is that lockdowns were not... Uh, an experiment which we should repeat when and it will be when a new pathogen comes along. In our two countries, the world as a whole is much more complicated. You go to Denmark, where I was a number of months ago, and it seems to me if they did it again, people would still do what the government said. And then when the government said no more masks, the next day, like every mask was gone. I think it's healthy to have some people wearing masks past the point where they need to. It's just a symbol that not all of us here agree. In Denmark, it's like all masked, the next day all unmasked. And I think they could do a repeat of that like any time. And uh, like that's the way that country works. It's not my preference, like it works for them. So I don't think every country has opted for liberty. But yours and mine, yes. All the more reason to be like very bullish on the Anglosphere. Of course. But at the time, of course, we all, all of us thought we would be following the science. That was a phrase used quite a lot. Except there wasn't any science of a lockdown. It was just a theory. We had the opinion of scientists, which is a different thing to science. But now, we had no data, but now we should have a world, a world of data on what happened in various countries, and looking at the ones who took this technique and that technique. Are you discerning any kind of pattern, any kind of, if, so let's decide whether you agree or disagree with lockdown. If you were to look at the evidence, are you discerning any pattern of evidence suggesting if in his defense or otherwise? 
Well, I think the pattern of evidence is if there's a new pathogen and you're not sure, some amount of risk aversion, it just will be politically necessary. And I think the places that didn't lock down at all in meaningful ways did lose more lives. How you evaluate the trade-off, I don't think there's, there's a simple answer there. But uh, in early stages, it, it could have been worse than we thought. And what we did is, to me, understandable. It wasn't scientific evidence in the sense of having been validated, but in, uncertainty is its own thing. Right. So you quite, are you also optimistic about, um, okay, you, you sound quite optimistic about liberalism, uh, certainly about democracy in democracies. Um, are you also optimistic about innovation? I mean, because there is, you know, Frederick Erickson, who's also speaking here, has written about the innovation illusion. About, um, and you, you have also written about um, how America's plucked all the low-hanging fruit. Do you see that fruit having grown back somehow? In 2011, I wrote that productivity growth, you know, was at an, basically an all-time low. But I predicted then, within 20 years, it would resume. We now see, in the span of like two years, COVID vaccines. There's an anti-malaria vaccine, it seems to work an anti-dengue vaccine that seems to work. Possibly vaccines against some cancers will work. It's a bit further out. Uh, green energy has made much more rapid progress than almost anyone had predicted. Electric vehicles are a thing in a major way in actual markets. Cost for solar and wind has fallen about 15% a year on a compounding basis. Fusion has some chance of working. And then artificial intelligence, which will revolutionize our lives within the next two to three years, when the new products are released, which will be very soon, people haven't taken that into account yet. So in my opinion, we, we're seeing a new wave of innovation based on the notion of computing power finally coming to bear to be something more than just, oh, I enjoy social media. Okay, so maybe those innovations might give us a better economic outlook than the one that's visible to us right now. Uh, a lot of the benefits will accrue to consumers, right? So life will be much better but let's say uh, you stop people dying from COVID with vaccines, which also came from England. Uh, it's not clear your per capita GDP grow goes up, right? Some of those are older people. Uh, your per capita GDP might go down a tiny bit. So we need to think there are some innovations we're doing now that won't fully be reflected in per capita GDP growth, but they'll make our lives much better. And the anti-malaria vaccines and the like, that's going to benefit other countries. It gets back to my point as England is the great altruist, right? So uh, enjoy the good you're doing for the world. Okay, great. Okay, well, I'll take some questions in, in a bit. But, but also, um, what do you think of, um, okay, quickly in American politics, Ron DeSantis? I make a On point not to follow particular candidates too much. I think it makes like people, commentators, sort of stupider rather than smarter. Uh, I think I'm fine with anyone other than Trump winning. And that's broadly what I would predict. I think Trump's time has passed. We'll pick someone. There'll be some kind of division of powers. Our traditional checks and balances will kick in. We'll do some good things. We'll do some bad things. We'll live to fight another day. That's my prediction. DeSantis is compatible with that story. Should I root for him versus someone else? I'll just wait till it happens and let you know what I think then. But I've noticed in your writings um, sort of, um, you seem to be getting increasingly frustrated with Joe Biden's economic direction. Well, they've made a lot of mistakes. They sent around an extra $2 trillion, right? Led to higher inflation, cost $2 trillion. For giving the student debt, I, I'm hoping that the court striking that down will stick. I think he has a poor team of economic advisors. And thank goodness that some of the Democrats in the Senate are not entirely crazy. But we, we will survive it. And on foreign policy, as far as I can tell in Ukraine, I think the Biden people have been good, as far as we can see. So it's not a total disaster of an administration, but on economics, they need far more in the way of market-oriented ideas. Right, and you, you say that they printed money, there is inflation. I mean, it is still not exactly accepted wisdom that those two things go together. Well, right now, when the British government did, we did QE in 2010, a lot of people said, look, you're going to pay the price for this and rampant inflation, this is crazy. It didn't seem to arrive. Now, it's very difficult to disentangle what happened during the pandemic from an inflationary boom, which hardly anybody, other than Andy Haldane, who was on the stage a few minutes ago, sort of saw coming. Um, 
Do you think it's that the people are, are going to get more cautious about money printing as well as a result of this? Do you think that lesson is sinking in? Well, I don't think you can aggregate money as one thing. So what matters the most for prices, to use US terminology, is something like M2. In 2009-2010, M2 growth was normal. We created a lot of reserves in each of our countries and then in different ways forced or encouraged banks to hold those reserves. That's not inflationary in any theory. But if you print up a lot of money and encourage credit creation and then tell people to spend it and enable them to do so and encourage loose fiscal policy from, for us, our states, then yeah, prices are going to go up a great deal. So it's not the only cause. There's been inflation around the world. But we wasted $2 trillion on something that hurt us and made us worse off. Just no reason we should have done that. If you want, spend it on green energy, spend it on whatever. Don't print up money and just tell people to spend it. So how much of the inflation do you think was down to the money printing? I don't think we know. I've read a number of papers on this. My guess would be something like, well, if our inflation peaked at like 8 to 9%, it would have been two percentage points lower without the money printing. But that's a guesstimate. I really don't think we know yet. All right. And why do you think hardly anybody in your profession saw the inflationary boom coming? It's so profound. It came so quickly. Um, and I remember when The Spectator did a cover um, announcing inflation, we were ridiculed by the Financial Times by saying, who are these guys? They're crazy. It was the absolute consensus that inflation was not a real threat. And now it's everywhere. So what, was, what made it so hard to predict? People talk too much in terms of the money supply. They thought back to 2009, 2010. There was a sense of aggregate demand is deficient no matter what you do, promoted by many economists. Uh, I didn't see how bad the inflation would be. I thought it would go up to 4%, which would be a modest negative. I thought the wasting of $2 trillion was the number one crime, not the resulting inflation. So I plead totally guilty. I just wasn't looking at all the money supply figures. I sort of figured, well, the US has a pretty good Fed. Like, they would never do it in such a way that would lead to 8 to 9% inflation. So I had too much faith in them. I screwed up. That was my mistake. The mistakes of the Keynesians were a bit different. It was just thinking we're always in a scenario of deficient aggregate demand, because they'd been telling each other that for a decade. Right. And how good are we now at predicting inflation? <laughs> trying to work out is, with what confidence can we say? Because right now, you'll have seen the forecast, pretty high inflation next year, but the year after that, back to 1%, 2%. Can we really, how much confidence should we be that this problem might have gone in 18 months, 24 months? You know, macroeconomics is an art, not a science. In the US, the very latest inflation report showed like a monthly, but then annualized rate of 3.6, I think was the number, and the core rate was not so terrible. Now, that's only one number. Ideally, you want three in a row. But there's a reasonable chance the US has turned the corner. I don't see anything like that in UK data. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. And markets re-exert themselves, supply chains being disentangled. For us, energy less of a problem than for you. For you, less of a problem than for Germany. I don't think it's going to do us in. Like, it's going to converge back to lower rates. I worry that central banks will get to like 3.8 and then just stop because they can be cowards with elections coming. But look, Reaganomics, we had inflation rates 4 to 6%. It was not the end of the world. We'll manage. And you mentioned markets reasserting themselves. Do you think that's happened now? But the bond markets having reawoken are now going to be keeping high spending, high borrowing governments in check world over. Well, that, but I meant also in particular supply chains. You look at prices for shipping cargo or, you know, queue waiting times at ports. It's not quite back to normal, but it's way closer to normal than it was at its worst points where, well, with, with cars, all sorts of, you know, commodities, it was hard to get the stuff at the prices you were used to getting it. That contributed to inflation rates. That is nearly over and no real signs of it coming back, unless it's like a particular thing you're buying from Ukraine, grain on some particular world markets, that's still a big potential issue. But a lot of that's been untangled because markets work once they're given the chance to work. Right, and it also seems that the energy prices aren't going to be nearly as bad as they were looking to be in August. If you looked at the, the gas futures, they were really quite shocking. They've come right down now. Energy, Germany's done a far better job getting its um, gas supplies, uh, reserves, back up to speed than people thought. Do you think we're now not going to see an energy crisis in Europe this winter? There's still some uncertainty there. So in part, there's an artificial glut of gas because so much storage was done. So the marginal gas is not worth much right now. 
and what that's indicating about the more distant future, say a year from now, when the reserves are run down and a replenishment needs to be done and no one knows how the war in Ukraine will go, uh, I would still be cautious on that one. The news we've seen is good, but I wouldn't celebrate just yet. It, it could still turn out very poorly. Okay, and one final bit of optimism before I'll take some questions. You, you mentioned how the price of renewable energy is coming down a lot. Well, the cost, price and cost, there's some tricks in this. But producing solar where you can do it, producing wind where you can do it, way cheaper than we'd been expecting. You but bet. you can't do it everywhere, so how that translates into price is not as good as we would like. I'm wondering if that makes you optimistic or, not, or pessimistic about the chances of hitting net zero, because right now, you know, the UK is, uh, we're one of the few countries to have passed a law committing the government to doing this. I think the cost is estimated as something like 50 billion pounds a year of doing this. Uh, I'm wondering if you think that, right, I know you, your ideal scenario here is a carbon tax, but it doesn't seem to be implemented you know, um, pretty much anywhere. But do you think technology might come along and make this agenda happen at a far cheaper cost than one we currently envisage? Absolutely. I think you'll get 80 to 90% of the way there. Zero carbon to me is a, a myth or delusion, but you don't have to get to zero. If you solve 90% of your problem and the technology spread elsewhere, we'll be okay. We'll squeak in under the finish line. But if you think of construction, food supply, we're not going to get to zero, right? That's just, you say zero because it convinces people more than if you say 87% or, right? You've got to say zero. Well, it's net zero. The idea is that you'd offset it somewhere else. We'll never be at net zero, but that's okay. <laughs> right. Well, it's not that okay if we've just committed, passed a law committing a very expensive, and we're going to tear people's boilers out of their houses and stuff like that. I mean, this is going to, in the cost of living crisis, inflicts quite a lot of extra costs. Already, electricity bills in Britain are 25% more expensive due to the, um, the green taxes on energy. I mean, right now, we have to be asking some pretty important questions about whether this goal, if it's illusory, is really worth all the economic pain we're going to put people through uh, in pursuit of that goal. I'm wondering what you think. I wouldn't rip out anyone's boiler. I mean, take this notion of southern England as producing ideas and public goods for the whole world and produce some additional technologies that will help China, India, growing African nations, Vietnam, solve their carbon emissions problems, and, and, and keep your bloody boilers. They're, it's fine. It's not going to matter. So forget the boilers. Focus on where you're already awesome and be more awesome. Do it. You can do it. You're doing it now. Okay, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. If <clears throat> anybody wants to put their um, hand up. And I'm not, yep. Yeah. Okay. Sir, at the back. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for um, sharing your views. My name is Fabio Boncello. And um, I was just wondering if you could channel what you told us today to give us your take on what it means for equity markets, both in the US and the UK. And uh, if you could touch upon technology and that sector has been hammered so far, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Is it time to get back into the markets, Tyler? I don't think I have good advice on equity markets other than to say buy, hold, and diversify. That has always been good advice for at least the successful countries. And you're a successful country, so do that. And keep in mind, your, your stock indices, so much of it you know, comes from foreign income. So if some things go wrong and the pound falls in value, the foreign income's worth more, and you have a kind of some extra diversification built in. I think there'll be an incredible boom in privately done AI companies that I would just say avoid unless you really know what you're doing. But it will be like the crypto boom. It'll be in every magazine, every newspaper. Incredible fortunes will be made and then lost. The stuff will finally work, but the valuations will, will be insane. And, Again, unless you really know what you're doing, don't be part of that. But buy and hold, diversify. That's my advice. It's good advice. Don't listen to whatever anyone else tells you unless it's inside information. And then don't listen for some other reasons. <laughs> You've got a fund that only invests in ideas from Indians, haven't you? Well, it doesn't invest. It gives away money. It's a philanthropic fund. It's called Emergent Ventures India. And my strong belief is that India is the talent epicenter for the world right now. I've met virtually all of the Indian winners. There's now about 80. We had a meetup in, in Rajasthan in August. Just phenomenal drive and ambition and focus and intelligence. And some sense of like how to create a synthetic intelligence to integrate ideas from many different fields and disciplines and bring them together into something that can be done. 
there's something about Indian culture and intelligence right now that has that synthetic flavor that I think is partly why there's so many Indian CEOs in Silicon Valley. And look, UK, Republic of Ireland, Indian origin leaders, like what's that? You said this before, like my goodness, wake up. US has so many great business leaders and so many of our top companies run by Indian origin individuals. Huge wake up call, we should all be paying far more attention to India. It's like being in Great Britain in 1910. You want to get something done, you should be paying attention to the US. Today you're in the US or UK, you want to get something done, you should be paying attention to India. Simple as that. And investing in Indian stock markets then. Is your country, is, is your confidence in the, I, I get you, Indian, the Hindu genius, whatever you want to call it, right? Individuals, I get it. But what about India as a country? Do you see this native genius translating itself into the transformation of this country of one billion souls? I'm very bullish on Indians and individuals of Indian origin. I have strongly mixed feelings about India, and I did just spend three weeks there. Their politics is screwed up. I know I don't understand it, but there are clearly some very bad things going on with religious tolerance, a funny kind of populism. And more and more in, in most countries, the stock market is not representative of what is going on, including the United States. So if you're bullish on country X, the lesson buy stocks in country X, it's a lot more of a leap than it used to be. So no, I'm not telling you to buy Indian stocks. That has a lot to do with a kind of monopoly crony capitalism and who is regulated in which manner and who gets to keep which privilege. But if you can do like Indian VC in a meaningful way, uh, that's what I would be bullish on. Okay, well, we're almost out of time, so I'll take one more question and then we'll um, and cut it off. And um, Bruce Anderson at the front here. Bruce, you don't need a microphone, do you? Okay, maybe you do. May I ask you about China? Um, now, a rational Chinese government would see the argument for a strong world economy based on free trade, which everyone gains. And after all, China needs, for political stability, it needs to be able to offer higher and, con and continuing living standards. An irrational Chinese government would see international trade as a form of imperialist, conflict of imperialisms, and would be mercantilist. Which road will they go on? I didn't catch all of that because of mic distortion. China, which basically, uh, uh, China has got rich on dealing with a lot of, uh, uh, basically going capitalist halfway there, right? Yes. Are they going to continue down there, or have they got to this? We've seen what's happening in, in the last party Congress with the sort of ZQ, the treatment of Dung. Do you think they're now moving away from the pro market reforms? Oh, absolutely, they're moving away. I'm bearish on China. They have terrible ideas, terrible leadership. Zero COVID is a disaster. Maybe in the last two, three days, there's some good news on their real estate market but it still seems badly overextended. There are special purpose vehicles that are off the books but finance what the local governments do. That's another train wreck and their labor force is shrinking and they've hit the middle income trap. There's incredible talent in China but the go-go years are over and there'll be a lot more decoupling and I think they'll get through it but it, it will never be as it was and you have to even worry about their stability medium term. So I'm not, not so bullish on China. Tyler, you, my, 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 my last question to you. you. I once heard you say that you think reading is overrated, that mankind is a physical species and we need to physically be out in the world to learn, to experience, to gather information that way. You also said London is your favorite city in the world. Why? It's the best city in the world. Uh, it? it might be my favorite, but look, you have the best bookstores. You have Waterstones and Daunt books. So to me, Daunt himself is a huge hero. You have like the second best Indian food of any country. So you're already like two for two. It's pleasant and walkable in a way Manhattan or New York City is not. I think the climate is much underrated. Uh, the Lucian Freud show, the William Kentridge show on right now, strongly recommend. You can come here any time of year. There's a half dozen like must see shows. The whole world comes here. English is spoken and you have incredible plane connections to other places. So that makes it the best city. It might be my favorite. And uh, I mean, books overrated. I was trolling because I'm well known as someone who reads a lot of books. But I think like Sam Bankman Freed bragged about reading zero books. That was a mistake. If he had read some of the humanities about hubris, uh, FTX would be in much better shape now. And then, uh, you know, most people don't travel enough. I think travel is a more fundamental 
source of knowledge than books. So my fellow intellectuals, I was encouraging them to travel more when I made that remark. And here, you're so wonderfully located to travel. If you had to pick a travel base for the whole world, I don't know which is the best place, but London is in the top tier in terms of both proximity and connections. Well, thank you for traveling here and being with us tonight, Tyler. Thank you very much.